Jeremiah. This morning we were in Ezekiel. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter number 1. Jeremiah chapter number 1. The man and his message. Jeremiah chapter number 1. Or you could title it, Are You Marching to the Beat of a Different Drum? Amen? A different drum. In Jeremiah chapter number 1. Everyone has found your place. Everyone following along. Jeremiah chapter number 1. Beginning in verse number 1, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. So there's no guessing about when Jeremiah <coughs> came on the scene, or actually when he went off of the scene, but uh, began right there in the thirteenth year of Josiah. Josiah was the godly king that came on the scene after the wicked king Manasseh. Judah at its worst under Manasseh. And then Josiah came in. I really believe there can be a Josiah. I was thinking about Josiahs in my lifetime. <clears throat> and I really can't think of a whole lot except maybe one. And whether you agree or disagree, there was peace in our country. We had strength and we had respect under Ronald Reagan. Under the eight years of Ronald Reagan. And uh, it was just a peaceful and a quiet time. It was a good place to live. Now it seems like everything's passing. They're taking down one flag, in which I, I'm not uh, too controversial over that. I, would, I didn't live in that era. I, I don't condone what went on in that era. But uh, if people are waving a flag just to bring back some bad thoughts, it's one thing. But waving a flag just to remember uh, some of the heritage and hereditary, I don't know if that's bad or not. But I do know what's bad is when you uh, light up the White House with uh, rainbow colors. Amen. I know that. Now, you can, uh, you can raise up a rainbow flag and say not take it down. But, but any other flag, they're taking the United States of America, the flag of America, and, and uh, burning it and stomping on it and spitting on it. Uh, I still believe this. I still believe this, that uh, people try from the top all the way down to the bottom to bring the country to its knees. And I believe that this fella up there has succeeded in trying to do that, or whether he's done it or not. But I do believe this. I believe a Josiah can come. I do believe it. And here's, there's always a Jeremiah thundering out the message. And the Bible said he began in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, that godly king. Verse 3. Now, that's one sermon. That's my thoughts on that. Let's get back to the book, back in Jeremiah. In verse number 3, it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah. So the beginning and the end of the great preacher Jeremiah. And he was a king of Judah under the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord, verse 4, came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, and to build, and to plant. Jeremiah had a message. His message was from the Lord. The Bible makes that clear in the verses that we've already read. If you'll notice verse 2, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah. It was God's word. It was God's message. It was thus saith the Lord. Verse number 4, then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying... Never one time did Jeremiah say, here's my thoughts and opinions like Brother Rowan does. He said, here it is in the word of the Lord right here in Jeremiah chapter number 1. And then in verse number 7, the Bible says, but the Lord said unto me, the Lord said unto me, it's the word of the Lord. Verse number 9, the Bible said, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth and the Lord said unto me. And then you look at verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me. There's no question about where the message Jeremiah had came from. Verse 12, the same thing. Then said the Lord 
unto me. Verse number 13, and the word of the Lord came unto me. Uh, and then uh, verse 14, then the Lord said unto me, chapter 2, verse 1, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. Now, what better message than thus saith the Lord? There is no better message than thus saith the Lord. I said this morning, I, uh, and, and other times I have said it, I love my job. My job is easy in the sense that if I'll just proclaim, thus saith the Lord, then the Holy Spirit has to do the hard part. The Lord has to do the hard work, amen? He has to do the convicting and bring that soul to a knowledge of sin and a knowledge to the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's no better message in all the world, <clears throat> excuse me, than thus saith the Lord. His message was very forceful. Jeremiah's message was forceful. In the book of Isaiah, you remember what Isaiah said about the word of God in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse number 11, it says this, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it, whereto I sent it. That's why I enjoy being in the Lord's army. If I give the word of God, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Just give the word of God. Thus saith the Lord. The, the message of Jeremiah was forced, very, very forceful. Jeremiah learned some things. Jeremiah learned because of the word of the Lord to be strong before people, but always be broken before the Lord. Be strong before people, but be broken before the Lord. Did you notice that Jeremiah's message was rejected? It was a good message. Why in the world, why in the world would anyone want to reject the message of Christ? I mean, in our predicament, knowing that I'm a sinner, knowing that I'm, I'm a sinner, and based upon the scripture, sinners have to spend an eternity in hell without the Lord Jesus Christ. And so why in the world wouldn't I listen to a man that's trying to speak and tell me how to stay out of hell? Not only tell me how to stay out of hell, but to keep my family out of hell, my children, my grandchildren, and my church members and everyone else. Listen to the message. It's a very powerful message, but people rejected the message. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter number 6 and verse number 10, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. Basically, why should I speak when they won't listen is what Jeremiah is saying there in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse number 10. People rejecting the word of the Lord. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter number 11. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter number 11. And the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 11 beginning in verse 18, And the Lord hath given me knowledge of it, and I know it. Then thou sh uh, showedest, 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 shooteth. Who? Okay. Me, their doings. <laughs> Amen. He showed it to me, in other words. Uh, but I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter, and I knew not that, that they had devised devices against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof, and let us cut him from the land of the living that his name be no more remembered. All I'm doing is preaching the word. Why do you want to kill me? Let us destroy him from the face of the earth that his name be no more remembered. But O Lord of hosts, verse number 20, that judgest righteously, that triest the reins and the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them. For unto thee have I revealed my cause. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, of the man of Anathoth that seek thy life, saying, Prophesy not in the name of the Lord, that thou die not by our hand. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword, and their sons and their daughters shall die by famine. So people rejected the word of the Lord to the point, to the point they wanted to kill Jeremiah. Now his message was from the Lord. It was a good message. It was a forceful message. It was a right message. But his message was rejected. His message broke his own heart. I've thought about this. If a man can't be like Exodus chapter number 32, talking about Moses in the ministry, loving his people so much, then he needs to find another job if he's in the ministry. Think about that. If you don't love your people... And if you don't love people, you need to find you another job. 
You need to get out of the ministry and go somewhere and uh, go, go, go to work in a factory. Jeremiah's message broke his heart. They threatened to kill him, but he still loved them. Who does that remind you of? The Lord Jesus. They rejected him, but he loved them anyway. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jeremiah chapter number 9, the Bible says in verse number 1, Oh, that my head were waters, and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. Uh, prophet. Jeremiah's message broke his own heart. Amen. In Jeremiah chapter 20, look over here now. It broke his heart, and I'm not trying to get your picture off of that, uh, your mind off of that picture, excuse me, but I want you to notice what Jeremiah thought over here in Jeremiah chapter number 20. Jeremiah chapter number 20. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter number 20 in verse number 7, O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. And of course, we know that God does not deceive anyone. We, we know that. God does not deceive anyone. Just listen to Jeremiah for a minute. O oh Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. People are making fun of me. They want to kill me. I, I thought there was going to be some rewards to this preaching and sharing the gospel of Christ. I thought that everyone surely... Surely, everyone's going to love me because I'm trying to help them. And the Bible says in verse 8, For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him. If preaching Christ is going to bring me heartaches, I don't think I'll mention him anymore. Now, we're too spiritual to ever think something like that, aren't we? We're too spiritual to ever have said anything like that. But Jeremiah, he's just a different breed, isn't he? No, Jeremiah is human being, flesh and blood. And I wonder how many of you, just get honest with yourselves, have been thinking about quitting. Then where, where are you going to go if you quit? Where are you going to go? Jesus looked at Peter and said, Will you also go away? And you remember what Peter said? He said, you've got the words of eternal life. Where else could I go? I can't find what you give anywhere. And if you'll, fin if you'll notice finishing up verse number 9, it said, I won't make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. I had to keep telling people about Christ. When you have the truth of the Word of God, the truth of the Gospel of Christ, what Jesus Christ did for you on Calvary is sufficient to get you to heaven. How many of you have heard this same message over and over and are still sitting in the pews lost as a goose in a snowstorm? Jesus Christ died for your sins. He does not want you to go to hell. He paid your sin debt. He satisfied the demands of a holy God. That is a wonderful message. Because of the message, because of the gospel, I heard and I believe, and therefore I speak. I have to speak. It has to come out. It has to come out. And so we notice sometimes there's some discouraging times in our lives. Sometimes there's some happy times. But Jeremiah was constantly being bombarded just by simply preaching the message that God gave him. Now, God had chosen, again, one of the most humble men to give one of the most harshest messages. Jeremiah was perhaps 20 years old when God's call came to him in the 13th year of Josiah's reign. I stopped right there in the 13th year of Josiah's reign, calculating Jeremiah's age. He would be around 20 years old. And then a thought came to me that age does not stop the power and the authority of the Word of God. Amen. Preach it while you're young. Preach it when you're old. Preach it when you're middle age. Jeremiah shows reluctance there in verse number 6 of Jeremiah chapter number 1. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Now, the reason I believe that he shows a little bit of reluctance there, and there's several reasons, and maybe you have your own theory, 
But uh, Jeremiah was the son of Hilkiah, the priest. You remember Hilkiah back in uh, the book of Second Chronicles in chapter 34, I believe it is. He's the one that found the law and began to read it under the uh, reign of Josiah. He found the book of the law, began to read it, and of course read the word. Josiah commanded that the word be read because Josiah knew that there is never a revival without the word of God. There is never a revival. There'll, there'll never be a revival at Faith Baptist Church apart from the Word of God. There has to be the Word of God preached. The Spirit of God has to work. You've got to come in with an open mind and a hope, open heart asking God to do something for you. And I hope that you've done that tonight. I really do. I hope that you've come in tonight and said, God, what do you have? I'm tired. I'd like to stay at home. I'd like to pull the covers up, turn the TV on, just stay here on Sunday. It's raining anyway and things like that. But if I go, I sure need to hear something from heaven. Well, my dear friend, if you'll listen, I promise you, you will. Thus saith the Lord. Jeremiah had a message. The task was demanding. Now, again, why was he reluctant? Well, he had stepped right into his father's footsteps. Who was his father? Hilkiah. Hilkiah was a respected man. Uh, he, was, he was a priest. He had authority and he had respect. He had been in it a long time. People had learned to respect Hilkiah. And here's Jeremiah saying, I'm just but a child and people won't listen to me like they listen to my father. Let me tell you something. Thus saith the Lord uh, will always work. It will always work. Doesn't matter how old you are. You know, I wonder if, I don't know, one of my sons, I don't know if they'll ever go in the ministry. If they do, that'd be great. One of my sons-in-laws, it'd be wonderful uh, if they'd go in the ministry. Uh, I remember when I went in the ministry, I said, I can't preach like Lester Roloff. Somebody said, thank God. And other, you know, but I loved Lester Roloff. I loved Lester Roloff. I can't preach like, preach like Dr. Lee Robertson. Well, you know that God called a David Rowan. He didn't call another Dr. Lee Robertson. And God's called you. If God's got his hand upon your life, I promise you this. Thus saith the Lord will be probably all you'll need. Amen. Probably all you'll need to gain that respect and that position that God wants you to have. So maybe he was a little reluctant because of his father's position. I, I don't know. But I want you to notice the task at hand. The task at hand. It was a very demanding task. And the Bible says in verse number 9, Then the Lord put forth, and this is maybe why he was reluctant as well, uh, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms. Notice what he's to do. He's to root out, he's to pull down, and to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. <clears throat> Everything has to be torn down, pulled down, destroyed, root out, pulled down, all this, throw down. And then what's he to do? Then he is to build and to plant. Did you know that verse is um, one of my favorite verses as far as my salvation goes? Did you know that after I got saved, I read that verse and it made perfect sense? Did you know before I ever got saved, everything that I believe had to be thrown down, tore down, rooted out? I had a preconceived set of notions about how a man should get to heaven and about how he should be good to God. And if my good works outweighed my bad works, then it could be possible, just could be, just maybe, that God would allow Peter to open the gate and let me in. Now that would have been a feat. If that was to ever to happen, whoever got in the gate that way could go to the very throne of the God and tell him to get up and let you sit down because you've earned your way to heaven. My friend, that'll never happen. Jesus Christ died, paid your sin debt, paid your penalty, a debt that you could not pay. What Jesus did what you could not do. He gained audience with a holy God for you. Amen. He's perfect. And every just demand of a holy God was satisfied in the person of Christ. And as a result, you can go directly to the throne of grace and find grace and mercy in the time of need. What a blessing to it. Now, this is a hard job. It's a hard job. Have you ever been in a, uh, you ever taught a Bible study or, a, or been, I've been in churches. I've pastored churches that other men have built. I have actually started churches myself. The Lord's allowed that to happen which was probably one of the most wonderful things that ever happened in my ministry is actually starting a church from the ground up, from my living room up, knocking on doors and talking to people. But when, <clears throat> when sometimes when you go in other churches, my first church I went in, I'll never forget it. Kathy will never forget it. 1985, first church I ever pastored down in Soddy Daisy, Tennessee. 
mercy sakes, it took a year just to tear down the root out before I ever tried to start even building up again. There were so many preconceived notions in that church about what a man should do and how a man should get saved. And you bring it, and even up in Crossville, Tennessee, uh, I went in there and a church had already been established and it was growing. It was a large church. But when the truth of the gospel came forth, it seemed like we had to start all the way from square one again. All the way from square one and start building up again and planting and watering and building up. Uh, but that's the same way even in the Christian life or a revival. We need to get back to square one. What do we need to do? Well, if you need revival, if you've grown complacent, you've grown little honorary, then let's do it God's way. Let's get back to reading the Word of God. If my people, which are called by my name, shall pray, let's talk to him a little bit more. It won't hurt us to talk to him. Somebody said, do you have scheduled prayer times a day? No, I don't, but Daniel did. Daniel did. Well, is there anything wrong with scheduled times of prayer? No, there's not a thing wrong with it. You can pray any time of the day, but if you're, if you're a little lazy on praying, it wouldn't hurt you to schedule a time to pray. Uh, morning, noon, and night. It wouldn't hurt you a bit to do that. So talk a little bit more with God. Read more of His Word. Apply His Word. Turn from your... And you know what the Word will do? It will come in you. The Word will, if you will let it, it will separate you from sin. This book will keep me from sin, or sin will keep me from this book. Amen. So read the Word of God. All right, so we see the task at hand was a very difficult task. The task, according to verse number 10, was to destroy and to build. Go back to square one. Now, it was a demanding task, and secondly, we see there in verse number 2 and 3 of Jeremiah chapter number 1, the times were difficult. The times were difficult. You say, well, under Josiah, it was a piece of cake. The times were difficult. The times were difficult because of the sins of Manasseh, and it just took 31 years for uh, Jehoaz to come on the scene. And then what happened after, uh, after Ronald Reagan left office? I mean, I mean uh, Josiah left office. No, I did that on purpose. What happened after Josiah left office? You see, it went back to chaos again. It sure did. The times were difficult. I do not suppose serving God is, is ever easy. Is, is ever easy. I'm thinking back. I'm trying to reflect. I've, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I've had some wonderful times. The, the, the greatest happiness and joy in my life has come from serving the Lord and seeing people get saved. But I don't really suppose that serving God was ever, ever easy. But some periods were a little bit more difficult than others. And I thought about that statement before I said it tonight. And then I put right now. The age we're living in now. A, we're considered bigots as it is. If you're a fundamental Baptist preacher, you're considered a bigot as it is. And you're already, you're already considered of, of, of hating people. Uh, people say that we hate homosexuals and we hate this and we hate sinners. And um, I had to help a young lady just the other night. Um, she, said, um, she said, my daddy said that God hated me. My daddy said that God hated, hated sinners. Well, I can't find that anywhere in Scripture that God hates sinners. I can find, and I know that some people would like to argue that, and you feel free to argue it if you'd like. But I can't find anywhere in Scripture God hated sinners, but I can find a whole lot of places God hates sin. Hates sin. But you know what I found? That He loved this sinner so much that He went to Calvary and died for me. I, I never, I never, I never in my life have done one thing to cause Him to come and die for me. Not one good thing have I ever done in my life to cause Him to die for me. To cause Him to lay down His life for His enemy. At one time, I was His enemy. And then when I thought I wasn't his enemy, I found out that I really was his enemy in my mind. Because I still wasn't sure that God was satisfied with my good works. Now I know for sure that he has never been satisfied with my good works, but he was awful satisfied with the work of Christ. Always has been. As a result, as a result, the works that I perform now he will accept. We're created in Christ Jesus under good works. So times are difficult. We have to watch what we say. We, we, can't, we can't use uh, words that we used to use when I first started preaching. We can't, or people, 
we're, we're automatically branded. You're, you're, you're a bigot. You're a racist or you're this or you're that. I can't use those words. I can't. And they were good words back when I first started preaching. But we have to change it. My vocabulary, the message hasn't changed, but the vocabulary is having to change. I, we were just talking in men's prayer meeting about a man in Vermont, a preacher in Vermont being arrested because he refused to uh, marry a homosexual couple. Well, come to find out that man, of course, um, uh, there's more to it than just saying a preacher was arrested. Uh, so if you'd like to check into it, I'm not going to go into it, but if you'd like to check into it, uh, there was some discrepancies there uh, in, in his so-called ministry, I, I'm sure. But do I believe that the time's coming uh, that, that we're going to have to watch what we say about homosexuality and sodomy and, and things like that? Because if we don't, they're going to come and, and uh, actually put Christians in jail. It happened under Nero. But it's here now. It, it is here now. But the time's coming. It's going to be more prevalent Especially, you'd say it never happened in the Bible Belt. So I can honestly say, I can honestly say that Jer I can see just a little, just a little bit of what Josiah was facing. I mean, not Josiah, but Jeremiah was facing. Uh, times were difficult. The task was difficult. Um, now, I want you to notice the condition. Notice the condition. The times were difficult. The, the uh, condition in Jeremiah's day, there was rebellion instead of obedience. Rebellion instead of obedience. Sounds like today, doesn't it? Jeremiah was born during the reign of Manasseh, Second Chronicles chapter 36. You'll find that uh, the, uh, the idolatry was rampant. And according to Second Chronicles chapter number 36, because of the sins of Manasseh, even after the revival in Josiah, the Bible said that they misused the prophets and had went totally against the Lord. And the Bible says this. I didn't say it. In 2 Chronicles 36, I can't find, I don't know the verse. I can go over there and look. But it says they had misused the prophets and so forth and judgment was coming. And the Bible says this, till there was no remedy. There was no remedy. Judgment was coming. Well, I wonder if America's got there. So there's rebellion instead of obedience. Now, number two, there was reformation instead of repentance. Reformation instead of repentance. Josiah was true blue. He was true blue, but unfortunately, the obedience of the many people was only a surface thing. How do I know that? Well, look at Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 10. Jeremiah 3. Now, we, we were talking about times were difficult. Times were difficult. There was a demanding task to, to tear down and then build. The times were very difficult. There was rebellion instead of obedience. And there was reformation instead of repentance. The revival under Josiah, as great, as great a king as Josiah was, and as much as he loved God, there was more, more reformation instead of true Bible repentance. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 10. And yet for all this, now he's prophesying under the reign of Josiah. And yet for all of this, Judah, her treacherous sister Judah, hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly, saith the Lord. Look up that word faintly. You know what it means? It means untruth or even as Strong's describes it or Strong's concordance defines the word faintly as a sham. A sham. The revival under Josiah was a sham. Wow. There were some good things happened under Josiah. I didn't say everyone was a hypocrite. But basically, for the whole, the national Judah, it was untruth. It was a sham. What happened in just 31 years? What happened when Josiah died and Jehoaz came on the scene? Immediately what happened? 
They turned, they went back into idolatry. Thank you, Brother Bruce. Don't be afraid to answer the question. You can read it for yourself. Just as soon as he got on the throne and Josiah died, they went back to doing what they were doing. So that tells me that it was more reformation than it was true Bible repentance. You know what I've seen in a lot of revival meetings in churches today? I've seen people acting feignedly. They'll make commitments. They'll come to the altar. They'll make commitments and they'll do good for a few days or a week or a month or two. And then you follow their life and it's nothing in the world but a sham. That's sad. What do we need right here at the Faith Baptist Church? A true Bible revival, a true Bible repentance. His times are difficult. Times are difficult. Rebellion instead of obedience. Reformation instead of repentance. And um, it was reformation. It wasn't a heartfelt, heart-changing regeneration. That's what people need. Amen. When you see true revival, you'll start seeing people get saved. More people get saved. Why? Because there's such a desire in the heart of the child of God. They'll be like Jeremiah. They'll want to tell people about Christ. They'll want to tell people about Christ. And we can tell people about Christ. And we need to tell people about Christ. We need to have that heartfelt attitude. We need to love them. We need to really do love people. We need, we need to. We need to. And we need to share Christ. If there's compassion, uh, the people are going to know it. So reformation instead of repentance. Now something else in Jeremiah's day. We're talking about the task at hand. There was rebellion instead of obedience. There was reformation instead of repentance. There was politics instead of principle. There was politics instead of principle. No sooner than Josiah died under Jehoaz, idolatry, idolatry returned. That's pretty quick. Pharaoh, what happened after that? Pharaoh removed Jehoaz and exiled him in Egypt and he put Jehoaz's brother on the throne... His name was Eliakim and changed his name from Eliakim to Jehoiakim or Jeho to Jehoiachin, excuse me. Jehoiachin in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 37. No, Jehoiakim, then Jehoiachin. And then Mat Mataniah, who was renamed Zedekiah. And you'll find, you'll find all of this. And there was one thing about um, Zedekiah, though, or Mattaniah, renamed Zedekiah, uh, over in Jeremiah chapter 38. Look over in Jeremiah 38. I'm looking at the time. Jeremiah chapter 38, and look at verse 19. And Zedekiah, the king, said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand, and they mock me. Zedekiah was more afraid of the people than he was of God. And that's what happens. That's exactly what happens. That's what happens if you don't get a man of God leading the people of God. They're going to revert back to exactly what they were doing. Zedekiah, actually Zedekiah, would ask Jeremiah for help. And then he would do the opposite. He would call him in and for advice and then do the exact opposite. Uh, at the same time, the court, uh, he would court the, uh, or, 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 I say use the word court, I don't know of a better word, he would court the ambassadors from neighboring nations. You see, it's good PR for political leaders to invite preachers in. It's good PR. And did you know that it's so good a PR, did you know the Antichrist is going to do the same thing? Read Revelation 13. He's going to do the same thing. The beast out of the sea is a political leader. The beast out of the earth is a religious or the ecclesiastical leader. The ecclesiastical leader is going to make an image of the beast and set it up in the temple, in the holy place. And he is going to encourage people to worship this image of the devil. So it's good PR to bring religious people in. You don't have to do what they say, just bring them in. Because they're going to help get the people that you need. What's happened in America? Same situation, same situation. 
You see, it's history repeating itself. That's all it is, history repeating. You'd think that we would learn a lesson by all of this going on in Jeremiah's day. Well, the humility of the prophet, he says in verse uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, he said, God, I'm inadequate, and that shows humility. But God's grace and protection would get him through. He would get him through. And God's grace and protection will get you through. God's, uh, of course, God's word would see him through, according to verse number 9 and 10. And when God's word from God's hand touched Jeremiah's mouth, it gave him the power and the authority he needed. God's word is always enough to do God's will. God's word is enough to accomplish God's will. Too many churches that God's word is not being proclaimed. Worship has become entertainment. Preaching has been softened to giving good advice when in reality we need to give truth. We give truth, thus saith the Lord, God will protect you, God will equip you, and God will enable you. According to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 3, God will establish you. You just give truth. Did Jeremiah fail in his mission? No, he didn't. People of the day were wondering why Jeremiah wasn't keeping pace with the world or keeping pace with his companions. Let me tell you why. It's because Jeremiah heard a different drum. Jeremiah made the right decision and as a, uh, as a result became one of the most unpopular prophets in Jew Jewish history. Friend, it isn't easy to stand alone. But the day has come where you're going to have to make a stand. Make a stand. We take a stand on salvation. No one's going to heaven apart from Christ. I don't care who you are, how you were raised. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, we've got some flack over that, saying Jesus is the only way. You're not going to heaven through Mohammed. You're not going to heaven through some ritual. You're not going to heaven through Buddha. You're not going to heaven through Hare Krishna. You're not going to heaven anyway but and by and through the death, burial, and the resurrection and shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way you're going to heaven. The day has come we need to start taking a stand upon the principles as well. Be counted. Let's be that one like Jeremiah that marches to a different beat. Amen. The world's all marching this way. Let's you and I turn and march the other way. All right. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Let's stand to our feet, please, if you will, and we'll be dismissed. <clears throat> all right. Does anyone have any comments before we're dismissed? Anyone? Anybody have any?